Revelation chapter 10, if you would, please. And if you wouldn't, just listen. I'll try not to steer you wrong. All right. Anybody? Where did that voice come from? <laughs> Anybody that's got any last uh, comment on the seven thunders? Anybody? Nobody did any study this week to try to determine what they might be? I think the Bible's clear that, number one, it is the voice of God. So, not just the voice, but the words that come out of God's mouth. So, they would be something that God uh, spoke. Um, it would be associated with the meaning of the number seven, which is perfection, completion, um, things like that, the Sabbath rest, and so on. Um, let's see, the voice of God, the words of God, um, the judgment of God is what they represent. Um, and that kind of makes sense here, um, that when he, uh, when this angel uh, roared like a lion, then seven thunders uttered their voices. <clears throat> so the lion is Christ. And uh, it represents uh, his announcement of what we're going to look at this morning. That the mystery of God is finished. And so you're, you're basically dealing with the seventh trumpet or the last trumpet that's to be sounded. Um, and so on. And the fact that. I believe that if God spoke it, then it's written down. He gives us a clear example of that uh, in uh, Exodus chapter 20. He spake the Ten Commandments, uh, and then he uh, called Moses up to the mountain, and he wrote them on uh, two tables of stone. And uh, when Moses, we know the story, when Moses or Charlton Heston, however you want to remember it, when he comes down from Mount Sinai, he sees the uh, fornication going on. He sees the, the, the false God and so on. And in Moses' anger, he tosses, uh, casts the Ten Commandments to the ground and they're broken. But uh, God doesn't just leave uh, his word unsettled. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And so God, who is showing his character and his nature and what he does. That if one copy of his word vanishes away, don't worry. God has another copy to replace it. That is very clear. When, so when Moses cast the uh, Ten Commandments down, God called Moses back up again with two tables. And he said, bring them up here and I'm going to write again those Ten Commandments on the front and on the back. So God is establishing with those Ten Commandments that, number one, they're written in stone, which means you cannot erase them, cannot take away from them. Number two, they're written on the front and on the back, which means you cannot add to his commandments. Number three, if the first version of them passes away, then I will write up another one to replace it. Uh, that same picture is drawn for us in the days of King Jehoiakim, who was the, uh, pretty much the last king over Judah before um, Nebuchadnezzar uh, brought in all of, the, uh, uh, all of the inhabitants of Judah and uh, Jerusalem and put them into bondage. When Jehoiakim hears the writing that's, on, uh, that's being read to him of the, uh, the curses and the wrath that that Jeremiah wrote down on that paper when he hears the Bible says about three or four leaves he takes the whole thing and he cuts it up with his pen knife slices it all up and then he casts it in the fire as if that's going that's over and done with I don't have to worry about God's word anymore it's over and done with and lo and behold Jeremiah takes his secretary and he says, get some more paper, 
get your pen out, because not only are we going to rewrite those things that were written in the first scroll, I'm going to add a bunch more to it uh, to follow up with that. And so God is showing forth his character and his method of operation once again in that if the manuscript fails and it's unreadable, God's going to have a duplicate copy ready to go. So what are you saying, Pastor Mike? I'm saying that I absolutely 100% believe that God preserved every single word of his word in spite of the fact that we don't have those original manuscripts that Jeremiah wrote on, that Moses wrote on, that Mark, or even John. John was the last book written. And surely that could have been preserved till now, 2,000 years. Not, there's not much. But that manuscript fell away because the grass withereth and the flower fadeth. And what John was writing on literally was grass. That's what papyrus is. It's a big, thick, fat... My microphone is on. The batteries are charged. Tick, 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 tick. I was watching... Um, is it still working? Okay. I was watching <laughs> some... Uh, videos yesterday and they were of like paranormal supernatural events and so on poltergeist activity and the guy who was reading the script and it might have been an art it might have been an, a computer generated voice but the guy reading the script was referring to someone who puts videos on tiktok as a tiktoker Yeah, he said it more than once, and I'm going, it's not a TikToker. It's a TikToker. Some of y'all just need to wake up, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, it was funny. Anyway, uh, God is, God's revealing to us his method of operation, that if one copy of the word vanishes away, and that's what those were written on. They were written on papyrus, which is where we get the word paper from. And papyrus is grass. It's this thick grass. They cut it down the lengthways and they take the individual layers and they weave it together and they set it out in the sun for it to dry and they have something which they can write on. And Isaiah 40 says, The grass withereth and the flower fadeth, but the words of our God shall stand forever. So even if the papyrus turned basically into dust, and those original manuscripts are not to be found anywhere on the earth. Don't worry. God knows how to preserve his word. Does he not? Amen. If he can preserve saints, he can preserve a piece of paper, can he not? That's what I believe. All right. Revelation 10 verse 5 now. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven. He's, this is where we get it. When you go into court, do they not have you raise your right hand? Unless, of course, you are debilitated or you, are, uh, you have something wrong with your right arm and cannot raise it or any number of things, then you raise your left hand. If you have no arms, then you just say your oath. That's where we get it from. We get that from the Word of God. And, and what you know, this angel did, who I believe is Christ, uh, raised, lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that therein are and the earth and the things that therein are and the sea and the things which are therein. So he's swearing um, by God. And you, you might say, now, wait a minute. He's swearing by God. Well, isn't he God? Isn't Christ God? Yes. There's an answer to that in the Bible. And he's, he's swearing by the God who made uh, the heaven, the things that therein are, the earth, the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein. Six things. That there should be time no longer. Now, we don't think <clears throat> that um, this angel here 
is saying, the clock has run out. There's going to be no more time. I'm going to end everything right here and right now. Because clearly, some things happen after he does this. So what are we to believe then? Well, I think it's easy for us to believe that uh, he's referring to the time that God has patiently waited to, uh, and he specifically mentions here, um, let's see, yeah, he specifically mentions in verse 7 that in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. So, back to verse 6. That, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. The time no longer is a reference to the mystery of God and what that or those mysteries are. Because there's several things that are linked by Scripture to the mystery of God. Several things, and we're going to look at those in a minute. That there should be time no longer. So in other words, whatever probationary period that the earth has gone through or that man has gone through or that let's say the nation of Israel has gone through, uh, whatever probationary period that they have gone through, the time is now up and God is going to reveal to Israel um, who the Messiah is. He's going to reveal the mystery, the thing that he has kept secret from the Jews all of this time uh, if you've if you've studied the Old Testament, you've studied the uh, oh, what can I what can I say? You've studied and seen the very person of Jesus Christ before he was uh, incarnated in Bethlehem on the day that he was born. You're seeing the very person of Jesus Christ in various forms but never identified as the Son of God or as the Messiah and so on. But he sure is making his presence known. And I'll maybe ask you about, so just kind of be thinking uh, here, I'm going to ask you ways that Christ revealed himself in the Old Testament. All right? But anyway, that there should be time no longer. Now, how is it that... Um, this angel, if he's Christ, how can he swear by God if, in fact, he is God? Well, the answer is in Genesis 22. You might want to make a note in your Bible that the answer to that, Revelation 10, 6, is Revelation 22. Verse 15, the angel of the Lord. There is one place where... Um, the angel of the Lord is Christ. And I'll show you that. The angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, and how do we know that this angel of the Lord is Christ? Because of what he said. By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord. For because thou hast done this thing and hast not withheld thy son, Thine only son. Why did he have to swear by himself, Gary? Why did he do that? Okay. When you swear by something or someone, um, you want to swear by the greatest or the biggest or the best. It's sort of like uh, putting up, if you're going to borrow money, and you put something up for collateral, uh, and the bank says, okay, what are you gonna, you're gonna borrow $600,000. What are you gonna put up for collateral? And you say, well, I have this stick of gum here. They, won't, they don't want that. They want something that is at least worth $6,000 so that if you default on the loan, they can get their money back or try to get their money back. So it's the same way with, with this oath here. You're gonna swear by the greatest. And if this is the Lord, there is no greater to swear by. Uh, let's see here. I thought I had that in here. No, I didn't. But anyway, the scriptures bear that out. 
that there's no, no one greater that the angel could have sworn by other than himself. So that's why he said, by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord. Yes. Correct. That is, that's, I don't have that in my notes either, but that's a good, that's a good way of looking at it. Okay. Um, who can forgive sins but God? Well, that was God forgiving the sins. Let me find that verse. Uh, yeah, Hebrews 6. Might want to turn there, verse 13. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater... He swear by himself, saying, Surely blessing, I will bless thee, and multiplying, I will multiply thee, and, and so on. So Hebrews 6.13 is the answer uh, to both uh, Genesis 22 and, I believe, Revelation chapter 10. Now, um, oh, I was going to ask you this question. Tell me in what way or what ways Christ chose to reveal himself in the pages of the Old Testament. Huh? A dove. Okay, that would be the Holy Spirit, but they, these three are one, so I, I will allow that. Huh? Fire? Yeah. The Lord God is a consuming fire. Okay. That's, that's pretty good. Do what? Right. He was one of the three men. And they look like men. They could not discern any other way. They look like men. They didn't have big angel wings sticking out the back of them. Flapping away. Losing feathers. They didn't have anything like that. In fact... These three men sat down and ate a meal and had their feet washed. But Abraham recognized that one of these was superior than the other and recognized that he was, in fact, the angel of the Lord or the Lord himself. Okay? Yes, Gary. And the fourth is the Son of God. That's about the most specific uh, appearance that we have. And it wasn't made by a Jew. It was made by a Gentile, a pagan God worshiper, multiple gods worshiper. And yet he knew who was in that fiery furnace. You know what I hear? I, I've actually had an argument uh, given to me about why all of the modern Bibles, and I mean every one of them, in uh, Daniel, what chapter is that? Chapter 3? Um where Nebuchadnezzar says, and forth is like the Son of God, in all of the modern translations, Nebuchadnezzar says something like, and the fourth is like a son of the gods, a son of the gods, a son of the gods. That's the other translations, a Holman Standard, um, which is the Southern Baptist Bible. They, they all say a son of the gods. Uh, one of them actually says one of the gods, and I'm like, that's like borderline blasphemy. In fact, I would not want to stand that close to that ledge. Um, and I had, a, I had a guy, he was in Bible college. In fact, he was going to the same Bible college I went to. And uh, my friend, Brother Craig, knew him. In fact, he was in his class and he said he likes to argue. And so he wrote me an email saying, telling me how wrong I was about Daniel 3.25, that uh, the Hebrew actually uses the word Elohim, and so should, should rightly be translated as gods, plural. And I wrote him back and I said, so does Genesis 1.1, but we don't translate it as in the beginning, the gods created the heaven and the earth. We don't say that and we don't believe it. So he, he wrote me back and he said, however, Nebuchadnezzar 
was a worshiper of multiple gods, and that's all he knew. So therefore, Nebuchadnezzar would have said a son of the gods. And then he wrote, since I now have proven you wrong, I'm not kidding you. Since I now have proven you wrong, you should respond to me back saying that I am indeed right. And I'm like, listen to the mouth on this guy. Um, but he saw, here's what, here's what he's trying to tell me. That Nebuchadnezzar, upon seeing God himself, did not recognize him. I don't think anybody who, when they die and they are carried up into heaven by angels, and they are placed right in front of God Almighty, that they're going to say, I'm sorry, I don't recognize you. I think every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Can I get an amen out of somebody this morning? So, back to this. The time shall be no longer, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound. Now notice um, something here that I overlooked for years. I never, ever gave it two thoughts. Boy, that's my... I've drawn circles real good this morning, ain't I? In the days of the voice, good grief, of the seventh angel, which appears to me that the sounding of the seventh trumpet is an event that lasts several days instead of the trumpet sounds, I don't know, a 30 minute charge or whatever. And then all of this stuff that's associated with the seventh trumpet starts happening immediately and is over by the end of, over before supper time. It looks to me like um, the sounding of the seventh trumpet and the things that follow the sounding of the seventh trumpet lasts for days, in the days of the voice of the seventh angel. Any questions? Yeah. And what did they blow on the seventh day? Yeah. You're learning typology, aren't you, Gary? Uh, yeah, that's a good that's a good analogy, very good analogy. They uh, they take seven days to blow those seven trumpets, and on the seventh day they blow it seven times. So anyway, that's just an observation on my part. I'm not going to chase it down. But anyway, the mystery of God should be finished. What is the mystery of God? Who wants to answer that one? Who wants to answer that question? Come on, let's. You guys, listen, we're going to pretend like we're in seventh grade again. And I'm going to ask you questions and you're going to give me answers. If you don't, huh? Salvation. Salvation. Uh, yeah, to who? To whom, I should say. Yes? Okay, to the Jews, correct? Anybody else? It's more than one thing here. All you have to do is look in your Bible for the word mystery or mysteries. It's not a hard study because number one, you're never going to find that word in the Old Testament. It's actually, the word mystery is actually from a Greek word, mysterion. That's where we get the word mystery. And it literally means a secret. Okay, something kept hidden. All right. Um, the Catholic Church is a mystery religion. And what I mean by that is um, there are secrets that are held by the hierarchy of the Catholic Church that is not meant 
for um, the lay people of the Catholic Church, in other words, the people who sit in the pews, that those mysteries are not for those people to understand or in some cases to even hear or know about. One of the things I would use to prove that statement is the Vatican vaults, the Vatican library. Can just anybody come in off the street, fill out a piece of paper, and get access to the underground vaults of the Catholic Church and access to all the books, ancient books, ancient manuscripts? The Catholic Church might have the entire Bible's original manuscripts down in that vault, but they're not telling nobody. Probably the reason they're not telling anybody is because more than likely the original manuscripts would disagree with the Catholic Bible on way too many places. Where else would they get their doctrines of devils? Um, but they are a mystery religion, in, even in their services. It is, they call it the mystery of the Eucharist. How that the priest, by proclaiming that the the wafer literally turns into the meat and the muscle of Jesus Christ and how the wine literally turns into the red blood celled clotting blood of Jesus Christ himself. They literally believe it turns into that. But it's a mystery because if you're a Catholic, Chris, you ever take communion, you ever take the Eucharist, did it taste like anything meat that you'd ever tasted before? Did it taste like jerky? No. Yeah, it tastes like paper. Your, your tongue told you that this was still a w little wheat thin cracker. Okay? But you were told by the priest to ignore that and to believe the mystery of the Eucharist. You're drinking the wine, okay? I'm sure you've tasted blood before. You know, that time you smarted off your wife. And you were tasting blood, okay? Um, and that wine did not taste like blood to you. So that's the mystery right there. Well, one of the mysteries is that it doesn't taste like that, but the priest tells me that that's what it is, so I guess I'll believe that. No explanation whatsoever on how that's accomplished, why it's accomplished and so on. Uh, but they actually have you violating uh, what was written in Acts chapter 15 in the Jerusalem Council. The Jerusalem Council said that to the Gentiles, number one, you're not supposed to eat anything strangled or that hung from a tree, Christ. Number two, you're not supposed to eat any kind of food sacrificed to idols, the Eucharist. Number three, you're not to drink any blood there again, the communion of the blood, drinking the blood. And so I tell people, if you get invited to a Catholic wedding or a Catholic funeral and they break out the wafers and they have everybody, don't do it. Do not put that in your mouth. That was, well, we only had four, uh, four rules given to us in Acts chapter 15. And three of them, the Catholic Church violates during the Mass. Don't have anything to do with it. Well, let's, let's look at the mystery. Turn to Matthew 13, Mark 4. This is what the mystery really is. And, and here's something you're going to notice if you've never noticed this before. I want to encourage you to do a study on the mystery. The word mystery or mysteries. It's mentioned in two forms. As I said, it's always in the New Testament. And every time you find the word mystery in the Bible, every single time in that passage or the next verse below, it's going to tell you exactly what that mystery is. So to us who believe the Bible, it's not a mystery, is it? Matthew 13, 11. Jesus had just given them uh, the parable of the seed and the sower. And so his, the disciples are like scratching their head going, what in the world? And so in verse 10, the disciples came and said unto him, why speakest thou unto them in parables? 
In verse 11, he answered and said unto them, because it is given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Now he's referring, I believe, possibly to Israel, definitely to all lost people. They don't understand it. They don't get it. They don't comprehend it. And so it will always be, even though it's written plainly right here in the text, they won't, they won't get it. They won't understand it. Um, but unto them it is not given. Mark 4, 11, And he said unto them, Unto you is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without, all these things are done in parables. So Jesus speaks in parables to those that are without, but to those who are born again, he speaks uh, those mysteries and he explains what they are. And again, it's not like we have secret books of the Bible that we don't let anybody who's not in our church read. It's not like there are ancient manuscripts that are only for uh, the pastors, the bishops, or the church hierarchy in some form. Um, anything that anybody wants to know about our God is written right here. And this is why that doctrine where people say, well, not everything uh, is in the Bible, not everything that God does and is is in the Bible. Uh, if it's not, then God's a liar. He's an outright liar. Uh, I believe that God wrote it down and it's right there in black, white, and red. Amen. Father, we ask your blessings on your word. We ask your blessings, Lord, upon this morning's service. We pray, Father, Lord, that you would guide my thoughts, my words, as I teach and preach to those. And Father, Lord, uh, stir it up in my heart as well. Remind me of the things, Lord, that you once showed me. I pray, dear God, that you would bless it. And let it be a blessing to all of those who hear and those, especially those who need it. Father, there's somebody out there right now, Lord, who's crying unto you. And uh, Lord, they just, they need help from you or they're going to fall out. God, would you help them this morning and bless them? We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen, Amen, Amen.